Yeah, so I'm a software engineer with telemetry. Uh, thanks for coming today. You know I'm like the last thing standing between you and happy hour. So just kind of bear with me for a second. Um, so anyway, just to get into it, um, this is going to be a little bit different than some of the other talks today. Uh, first of all, telemetry deals mostly with uh, something called the Internet of Things, uh, which is a little bit different than your typical cloud platform. Um, the Internet of Things is this concept that devices will, you know, have, have a connected home, connected car, and devices will opt to talk to each other rather than talk to you, so it's kind of reducing the human interface. Um, so in order to make that possible, that world of things talking to each other and not talking to you and interfacing with your computer less, um, we need to have good communication lines, good communication protocols, things that communicate well when you have a constrained environment, when you have maybe an 8-bit little 8 -bit processor with 2K of, of RAM or something. Uh, so it's a little bit different of an um, environment than you might be used to. So telemetry is kind of provides the backbone to the Internet of Things. Uh, that's kind of our little tagline is. Um, provides a MQTT broker, uh, which we'll get into that in a minute. And we also do some uh, like enterprise services like protocol onboarding for like custom one-off um, protocols. Uh, lastly, we're a startup, so we do use the cloud pretty extensively. I don't think some of the stuff we do would be possible without the cloud. We use Amazon, but it's not particularly important. It's just, it just could be Rackspace, it could be anything. So a little bit about uh, MQTT. First of all, it's a PubSub protocol, much like Kafka. Um, publish, subscribe. Uh, so in a pub, pub sub system, you have a publisher that's the, kind of the source of messages, and you have the subscriber that's kind of the sync subscribers, so the one that's consuming. Uh, and then the broker is in the middle. Um, some people like pointing out that, yeah, there's a single point of failure. There's the broker. Um, I'll get into that in a bit. Um, but aside from that single point of failure, it's a pretty nice paradigm because uh, your publishers are kind of insulated from your subscribers. If some of the publishers die, the subscribers don't really notice. So that's, that's kind of nice, especially in a constrained environment where your publishers frequently go offline or change IP addresses unexpectedly. Um, so another, some other reasons why we like MQTT. First of all, it's a standard. Um, IBM first created it like 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, a lot of people have adopted it since. Um, there's some WebSphere support for it. Uh, it's also a really lightweight protocol. So it runs on top of TCP. Um, and on top of TCP, it only has like a two byte overhead. It uses a lot of bit shifting. So unlike, say, HTTP that, uh, that uses plain text, um, uh, MQTT we use a very compact format. It's also very easy to parse. Um, by easy to parse, I don't mean for humans. Like HTTP is easy to parse for humans because it's just plain text headers. Um, MQTT is easy to parse by computer. Um, one of the reasons is something uh, called uh, length prefix strings. Uh, so when you're reading through the, the network packet, you come to the length first, and then you can make an array. You know exactly how much data you need to read in to read in that string. And that actually helps a lot when you're in a constrained environment, um, especially those, you know, when you only have 2 to 4K of memory available to, to you total. Um, also, a big, another big point is that uh, unlike Kafka, it has very lightweight clients. The, the broker is, the MQTT broker is complex and the client is very, very thin. Kafka, the, 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 the clients are very thick, very smart, very intelligent, and the broker is pretty thin. So it's quite a bit different. Um, lastly, uh, just on MQTT, it's also very reliable. Uh, so TCP guarantees message delivery in that if it doesn't get delivered, it'll let you know that it fails. MQTT actually does guarantee message delivery. It'll keep on trying uh, connection breaks, IP address changes, which happens frequently. Uh, if you're on a cell network, say you have a connected car that's, or a um, Mack truck or something that's uh, driving cross country, it's gonna change uh, several, uh, IP addresses several times. It goes through different uh, uh, cell areas. Um, so QoS, uh, quality of service uh, zero is just TCP guarantees, and there's a QoS one and two that uh, gives extra additional guarantees on top of that. 
And then finally, uh, it's secure. I mean, this isn't a great amount of security, but combined with TLS, TLS gives you the, the encryption, and with the username and password, you have a uh, identity. So between the two of them, you can kind of uh, guarantee the integrity of the system. So it's, it's a nice little protocol, um, small, simple. Uh, the, the spec is only a few pages. It's pretty neat. Um, implementations in just, just about every language. So again, with pub subsystems, just a quick run through. I'm sure you've already done this a million times, but you have uh, a set of publishers and a set of subscribers. And kind of like Kafka, we publish to topics. However, unlike Kafka, uh, the topics are what we call dynamic topics. So we have topic patterns. Um, so you might have an uh, a topic like com.example slash device slash, you might put a little uh, identifier in there, like a device ID, and then something else. So there's two different wild cards. There's a plus and a, a pound. Uh, they're not particularly important, but if you want to know, um, the pound matches several topic uh, segments, and a plus matches just one single topic segment. This is uh, an important point, because um, the, the topics are very rich. Uh, you don't need to declare it. It kind of makes it, it kind of adds to the, the simplicity of MQTT. Um, another reason why we like it. Um, let's get into this. Okay, so the problem we were addressing at, at telemetry is we needed to scale up to a certain level. Uh, we're in the cloud again. Uh, we need to scale up to, say, you know, millions of connected devices. I uh, have two million written down here, but it's actually going to be you know, four million, eight million. It's going to keep on going higher and higher. Uh, so we need to be able to scale linearly. That's the most important thing. Um, as far as messages per second, it's actually not that high considering how many connected clients there are, mostly because a lot of clients just hop on the network for just a little blip, publish a bunch of messages and go back off. Or they might come back on and receive a bunch of messages. And it goes both ways. But the single uh, hardest um, part of this is the single subscriber. Uh, and I'll get into that in a bit, why that's so difficult. Um, it's, yeah. So again, with the scaling goals, we're in, we're in the cloud. So we're, uh, we're shooting for some horizontal scaling. And I'm sure everyone in this room probably fully understands the, the perks of horizontal scaling. Uh, so like that, that broker isn't a single point of failure anymore. Now we can have a little more availability, kind of reduce cost, or actually increase cost in some cases. <laughs> and then. Uh, So problems with scaling MQTT. First of all, uh, load balancing. When you, when you first address the horizontal scaling problem, you got to spread the load across all your servers you have now. Because if you're just going to one, you're not really utilizing the extra hardware. Um, so we use something called uh, HAProxy. I think it's frequently used. There's another, just several other you know, proxies out there that can do that. The way the, that load balancing works is it forms a connection from the device, the client, to the load balancer, and then another uh, TCP connection to um, the server. Uh, with MQTT, um, TCP connections can frequently be, uh, they're, they're long lasting. Usually more than a split second like HTTP, it's usually longer like days or weeks sometimes. However long uh, you can maintain a TCP connection, it's usually how long it'll last. Um, so, uh, the HA proxy in itself is not a great, uh, t t it's going to require a little more than that. So we also used another concept called uh, DNS load balancing, which is not a really a great uh, load balancing um, strategy on its own. Um, what, if you think about DNS, it's kind of a hash map. You have hosts and you have IP addresses. So you send a request to the DNS server, resolves, uh, to resolve a host name and it gives you back an IP address. With DNS load balancing, you actually load the DNS server with a list of IP addresses, all the IP addresses of your server. And so when you resolve an IP address, it just goes and hands you the next item in the list and just kind of uh, rotates the whole list. So it's kind of this round robin uh, way of uh, load balancing. It's not great because you, you can only really do uh, round robin. You can't really, um, uh, can't use some statistics like your, how much load you're under. So it's not 
it's not a terribly great um, way. So as far as load balancing goes, it, it wasn't really all that effective. We, we did all we could with HA proxy and DNS load balancing, and you can kind of sort of balance the load, but it, in the end, it's just kind of luck of the draw um, <laughs> about what, what you end up getting. Um, as far as DNS load balancing, another point to mention is it's a lot more effective if you force the clients to not cache the DNS. So if it goes to the server every time, you end up balancing a little better. Uh, last point on there, uh, with QoS 1 and 2, since the reliability is better than TCP, uh, we have to use a, some sort of file store or per persistent store of some sort. Uh, we use Cassandra in this case because uh, Cassandra has a consistent hash ring. So it's it's uh, horizontally scaling at a linear, linear rate, so um, it can help us scale as far as we need to scale. At, uh, yeah. Um, also, back to the, the single subscriber. This is, this is kind of how the subscri uh, single subscriber looks like. You have a lot of publishers. They go through the broker. And then you have a wildcard consumer that we call the firehose uh, consumer. Consumes all the messages that are being published. Uh, when you break that down a little bit, it's uh, a little bit more tricky because now we have this load balancing solution that's kind of hacked into there. Um, so you have a bunch of publishers publishing to, well, when they connect, they, they have to go through some sort of load balancing solution. So there's no way to predict exactly which broker they're going to connect, connect to. Uh, so they kind of connect to an arbitrary broker. And then the message just gets published out to a su subscriber. You break, down, break that down a little bit further. It's not even that simple because if you think about it, the subscriber also has to go through the same load balancing uh, mechanism. And so we can't really guarantee uh, what broker the, the subscriber is going to connect to. So what you end up with is you end up a, a hot node. Um, so when messages are published on any particular broker, they all end up going through that broker that the subscriber is attached to. So this kind of killed our goals of horizontal scaling. So this is like the crux of the problem. And we kind of need to get past this. Um, so our first, uh, first thought is, uh, let's just use HTTP. I mean, it's pretty simple. Everyone's quite familiar with HTTP. So this is kind of how it looks when it's set up. Um, same sort of, OK, there's lots of publishers. They so get load balanced into the brokers. And then when, you get, when the message comes into the broker, it gets published directly out to um, a URL, uh, another HTTP server, which effectively is a, has a load balancer, but it's more of a normal sense. A load balancer. So this uh, this actually worked pretty well. Um, the benefits is it's really simple, very well studied. Like everyone does it. Um, anybody coming out of college usually understands generally how this works. Um, and it was it was relatively efficient, and it did scale horizontally. So it did it did achieve those goals. Some of the the problems we're having with it is HTTP tends to be heavy. Uh, one of the big reasons, one of the big things I mean by that is when you make an HTTP call, you have to establish the connection, and you have to send the request out, and acknowledge the request, and send the response, acknowledge response, and finalize the connection. All in all, you're looking at like nine TCP packets, which we can, we can do a lot less of that than that with MQTT, so it was kind of like, ah, oh, man, that kind of stinks. But that's not, that's not that big of an issue. Um, realistically, we can just throw more money at it. And, uh, get past it. However, one of the bigger issues for us was uh, the subscribers have to always be available. And so the retry logic um, and all the corner cases for the retry logic, uh, so if the server, if the consumer server is down, uh, what do we do? Do we, what we store it for a little while? When do we retry? When do we know to retry? Um, they can't just pull, so we have to push it all the time. So it's a little tricky uh, how, to, how to do that. Um, so then we, uh, I was reading the uh, LinkedIn's paper on uh, Kafka at the time, and I was like, wow, this would be like really, really easy if we just threw Kafka into the mix. Uh, it's, I know it's another you know, piece and makes it a little more technology stack, but let's, let's just try it out. So again, LinkedIn, the uh, last presentation is really good if you're around for that. Uh, LinkedIn um, uh, made uh, Kafka for something they call distributed log aggregation framework. 
And at first, this confused me, like, oh, log aggregation. Well, that's not what I'm looking for. But then dug down into it. It's, it's just a pub subsystem. You have publishers and subscribers, and you have brokers. Um, then I dug into a little more, because I was like, well, this is curious, because, I mean, it scales a lot better than MQTT does. How come, how come it scales so well? Well, I mean, it's really meant for server-to-server -server environments. It's not meant for constrained environments. One of the big reasons is it's got really, really smart clients. In fact, it kind of inverts that, the load so that the clients bear all the load and the brokers are relatively thin. And one of the reasons why is it uses uh, Zookeeper. And I don't think you could ever run Zookeeper on a little 8-bit sensor actuator or something. So, um, so it's a really cool little uh, framework um, or tool. Um, Again, uh, Kafka does not have uh, dynamic topics. It has something called, uh, it has a, it's more of a static topic. These static topics actually are represented as uh, actual files on the file system. So when a message comes in, uh, it gets just simply appended to the end of that file. And you can keep on appending messages as you go along. And then when a consumer requests a, a message, when it subscribes, um, it just gives a, a message offset. And so the message, the message ID is the same thing as the message offset. And so it just scans to that place in the file and just starts reading messages. This is a really, really efficient way to, to write a pub subsystem. And I really thought it was brilliant. Um, again, it probably wouldn't work for uh, Internet of Things applications, but if you're trying to replace uh, AMTP or one of the other, like XMPP or one of the other, um, pub subsystems, it might actually work really well for that, potentially. Um, so another challenge we had, like uh, now we have MQTT with dynamic topics, and we have Kafka with static topics. Uh, luckily, uh, Kafka also has something that's called a key. So you have a topic and you have a key. Um, the topic is static, but the key um, can be dynamic. So we took the static information out of the MQTT topic, uh, made that into the Kafka topic, and then we took the dynamic parts of the uh, MQTT topic, like the device ID and, what, and whatever else, and threw that into the key. Uh, so the key, uh, the key is used. It's also kind of like Cassandra. It's kind of a consistent hash ring, um, and so it's used for balancing on the brokers. But it's also used for uh, it's called a subscriber group. So with MQTT, you can subscribe and pull messages. Um, with Kafka, you can actually take one subscription. You can take that Firehose subscription and split it out. So say like you have four uh, nodes in your uh, Kafka subscriber group. Um, you can take that Firehose subscription and kind of kind of throw a quarter of the messages at each of the, the um, members of the subscriber group. It's a cool little feature. Um, and it helps us scale really well. So this is kind of how we changed our, our, uh, our uh, architecture to, to, to deal with that. So again, you have publishers publishing through load balancer into the, the broker. When the, message, when the broker receives a message, uh, it publishes it straight to Kafka. And Kafka is able to um, balance well because of the consistent hash ring. Um, and it doesn't have the same problems as our MQTT brokers did. So it was a pretty, pretty elegant solution. Um, and it's pretty easy to grasp, your head, uh, to grasp. The only thing that's missing from this picture is the subscribers. So Kafka in that box is just the brokers. And subscribers can uh, pull from there. Um, so as far as results, we, we achieved all the results we were looking for. And better yet, it was uh, horizontal um, linear scaling. So kind of that near, near infinite scaling. Um, so, and the bigger thing is we didn't have any of those tricky uh, uh, corner cases with like the uh, HTTP retry. Um, when you publish to Kafka, you just simply publish and it just keeps his messages forever. And a subscriber can just pull when it's ready. And so if the publisher and subscriber aren't alive at the same time, it's not a big deal. They can go offline for a week and come back online and be processing for a few days while they catch up or whatever. <laughs> Um, so some of the things that uh, were kind of my wish list, and yeah, I'm just saying that uh, security is a big thing. Uh, 
right now we just uh, set up a VPN from uh, between the two clusters, and it works. Uh, the the problem is um, our clients are, aren't part of our company, so we have to set it up individually and run through some processes. So that's it's kind of a pain. Uh, I wish there was a better security story. And also, Kafka configuration is a lot more of a, a headache than TCP uh, than uh, MQTT uh, configuration. MQTT it's mostly just get up, set it up, go, and hands off. Uh, even even our own brokers that we create ourselves, there's not much configuration. Uh, when you um, subscribe to a client, it's it's really easy. You just kind of give it a URL and subscribe to a top topic and start getting messages. With Kafka, you got to set up the zookeeper uh, configuration. You got to sometimes tune the garbage collector if you're really looking at high loads. And uh, so there's a lot more configuration there. Um, so, as, but all in all, I think it was a very successful um, little uh, experiment, and it went well. And I think uh, I'd recommend Kafka for a lot of people trying to scale. Um, as far as I mentioned, uh, Internet of Things, I just want to throw in a little uh, kind of selling point. Uh, I th in, in my opinion, some of the most exciting things in open source are probably in the Internet of Things uh, arena right now. Um, some, uh, so Internet of Things is kind of split up into two areas. You have like the home automation side where you're connecting your TV to your refrigerator, and to, which is to your car, and some of it's kind of stupid, but some of it makes sense. <laughs> uh, and in, in that area, there's a project called OpenHab uh, that's basically just coming up with a lot of uh, um, tools and uh, standards to, to facilitate that happening. Uh, also, if you haven't heard of AllJoin, I'd really suggest looking it up. I mean, uh, I talk a lot about like protocols and stuff, but uh, AllJoin kind of makes all this device-to-device -device communication as easy as object-oriented programming. It's, it's pretty neat. Uh, you, they just, a device exposes a, a standard interface and any device can consume it as if it already knows how it operates. It's a really cool concept. I uh, suggest getting into. Um, also on the, the connected car, OpenXC, uh, if you know what an OBD2 connector is, it's a little connector that's underneath the dashboard of your car and it pumps out lots of diagnostic information. Could be boring to a lot of people, but some people get excited about lots of data, you know, big data. So um, OpenXC is a little project that uh, uh, just helps you figure out how to get the data out of your car and make sense of it, graph it. Um, and again, iHub is uh, a project written around, uh, around security of Internet of Things. And I just want to give a shout out to iot.eclipse.org. It's not really a project in the normal sense. It's just a kind of an aggregation of a lot of places to start, a lot of projects, a lot of uh, standards and whatnot. Um, so with that, I, I actually am for some reason, writing a book about the Internet of Things. So I hope it turns out well. But I just want to <laughs> sell that for a little bit. But after that, um, does anybody have any questions? I explained things perfectly. Apart from Kafka, what else did you evaluate um, outside of the HTTP? Did you look at kind of other things in the, in the Kafka space um, apart from the HTTP um, kind, of in, kind of interim solution that you mentioned? Um, so is there any kind of other cluster-based solution that you'd looked at to solve uh, the problem? No, I kind of saw the paper. Kafka paper and I already read it and kind of spoiled the other options. <laughs> Oh. You mentioned one of the things was being able to be offline and then the consumer would come back and process and mm -hmm. you phrase it as it's, they'll be there forever, but like what sort of retention policies are you actually doing because Kafka will drop data, right? Yes, process. Kafka will drop data and it's not smart to hold on to forever because you eventually will fill up. Yeah. Unless you have infinite storage like Google does. <laughs> um, so what do you guys use? Like what are your kind of settings to make sure that someone, the data will be there the next time the we, connectivity happens? We hold data for a month. Um, but it's configurable. So we have a lot of, a lot of big data here.
So are you still using HTTP from each one of the devices to send the messages in? No, we no. use MQTT. Just MQTT, okay. So yeah, MQTT is a really light protocol. Uh, it's really well fitted for that sort of thing. There's a few other IoT protocols, and if you went back to eclipse.org, uh, iot.eclipse.org, um, there's a few other uh, protocols linked in, uh, linked to that page. Um, there are CoAP uh, as well as uh, MQTT. CoAP is a slightly different protocol. It's, um, it's actually more of like a lightweight HTTP. It's like compact binary representation. It runs over UDP. Nice. Um, so there's a few other options when you're talking about uh, sending uh, telemetry data or, or data of any sort um, from uh, constrained environments. Just in terms of the subscribers and the consumers, um, what are your use cases at, at that side of things? Do you use any sort of statistics warehouse or you know, um, Hadoop? Have you, you know, what are you crunching at that end um, that you can talk about? Um, I mean, you, you mentioned the start. The reason I ask is you mentioned the start that the Internet of Things is largely about things talking to each other. Um, but it seems to me that you, you are obviously using that data you know, internally or that there's some value to be gained out of it without just these devices sending telemetry data to one another, which is clearly... No, absolutely, not what's yes. There, there, this, is what, this is why I'm so fascinated by the Internet of Things. There's so many different facets to it. So you have this, uh, yeah, the inner device communication, which a little device like a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino isn't going to be holding a lot of data. But there are other things where you do want a whole lot of data, um, like especially when you're in the, talking about MQTT and the telemetry, telemetry data. Um, so, yeah, so we store, so we have, a, we have some mechanisms to automatically store data for, that's published to our brokers. Um, you mentioned uh, Hadoop, yeah, so we have, we might store things to HDFS. Actually, we don't store it to HDFS, we store it to Cassandra. And then we run a Spark cluster on top of Cassandra, because there's some plugins to do that. Uh, and that works pretty well. Spark, I, we, we write in Scala, uh, Scala anyway, so Spark just makes a lot of sense to us. Uh, it's a little bit easier than writing raw Hadoop jobs anyway. Uh, any more questions? Okay. Well, um, thanks for coming. You can you can go to happy hour now.